Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm just gonna go ahead and jump right into it so that uh, we can stay on time. Early in the pandemic, the hashtag, we're all in this together became very popular. It was meant to convey the idea that COVID-19 was a great equalizer and that our collective well-being depended on all of us. While that may be partially true, the sentiment rings hollow and it ignores the many ways that racial capitalism structures vulnerability and disposability. Black, brown, poor, disabled, elderly, trans, undocumented, survivors and imprisoned human beings did not need a global pandemic to remind us of our precariousness. Nor did we need the moralizing of know-nothing celebrities who urged us from the comfort of their lavish homes to stay inside so that everyone could be safe. What COVID-19 did was to intensify our vulnerability and to bring our disposability into sharp relief. As the world shut down and many of us were under orders to shelter in place, black and brown low wage workers who were struggling to make ends meet before the crisis were left to sort out how they would pay for basic necessities like rent and food without any income or to risk their lives to continue to work if work was available. Because black people are overrepresented in the lowest paying sector jobs, and they are usually the first to be fired when there is an economic downturn, the pandemic intensified their vulnerability. Absent a meaningful social safety net, most people would see what was already a bad situation get worse. In the middle of a mass health crisis, those of us with loved ones in prisons were thinking about ways to support and advocate for them, while also attending to our own needs and in many cases, those of our families and communities. At the same time, many incarcerated people were tapping into their existing networks to raise awareness about the conditions inside of prisons and to demand things like personal protective equipment, cleaning supplies, and the release of vulnerable prisoners. Many of us were already engaged in organizing mutual aid efforts pre-pandemic, and we shifted or expanded those efforts in response to COVID-19. What we understood in those early days is that it's something that we have always known to be true, that the state would not be willing to help us. We would have to help ourselves. My goal today is to highlight the ways that COVID-19 intensifies existing vulnerabilities and has been used to justify the accelerated disposability of prisoners. First, I'd like to briefly sketch out how the idea of crime is used to preserve and expand the carceral state in order to illustrate how racial capitalism structures vulnerability and disposability. Second, I wanna share an example of a mutual aid project that grew out of the podcast that I co-host. Finally, I'd like to talk about what happens next. Those who argue that prisons are necessary to the social order and public safety often talk about crime. Crime is discussed in terms of individual behavior or it is used to scapegoat whole groups of people. There is seldom any discussion of how crime is connected to structures such as capitalism, racism, heteropatriarchy, and so forth. Crime is thought to be both ambiguous as in there's crime happening out there somewhere and specific, you could be the victim of a crime. In this way, the idea of crime is used to motivate public policy and it has spawned whole industries, even as data show that violent crime fell dramatically over the last 30 years. Most of us are aware that black, brown, poor, and mentally ill people are overrepresented in a criminal punishment system. And these are the groups targeted for increased surveillance, management, and control through policing and incarceration. We live in a society that has agreed that it is okay to exploit vulnerable people and to dispose of them when they are no longer able to produce value. This in a nutshell describes the process of racial capitalism. Policing and prisons are the mechanisms and log logics used to preserve this arrangement. This is important to understand if you wanna make sense of a country that has more than 2.3 million people in prison, including 200,000 people who are serving life sentences, and 50,000 of those are serving life sentences without the possibility of parole, including both of my sons. COVID-19 makes a bad situation worse because those of us that do direct prisoner support and organizing were already fighting an institution that treats our incarcerated loved ones as disposable. 
The pandemic gave officials added cover to put in place policies that they claim are for public safety, such as lockdowns, putting uh, prisoners in extreme isolation if they became symptomatic, and continuing to move prisoners around to different facilities. A few days ago, there were more than 29,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in state prisons, and just over 1,700 cases in federal prisons. The death toll continues to rise. And so far there have been 414 confirmed deaths in state prisons and 64 in federal prisons. In spite of this, officials have been reluctant to release prisoners citing concerns over public safety and claiming that they have infectious disease protocols in place and are able to manage this crisis without having to release anyone. I'd like to shift focus now to uh, share an example of the mutual aid project that I was a part of developing in support of prisoners. Part of the work that I do for my sons and on behalf of other uh, incarcerated people is wide ranging and it includes everything from advocating for them to get medical treatment, to organizing phone zaps, to working to get people out of prison. Over the years, these strategies have become, become an important resource that I found myself sharing uh, with, with them and with other people that have loved ones inside. So I started to write these things down. That document evolved uh, into something that was intended for primarily personal use to something that I shared uh, on a Beyond Prisons Facebook page and uh, that immediately sparked a wave of support from many of our listeners uh, who wrote to us to volunteer to help us develop um, that, that resource. What we came up with was a, a short guide, um, and I have a copy of it here, um, for supporting prisoners during the COVID-19 crisis. And it includes information on what to do if your person inside gets sick, um, at how to add money on commissary accounts so that uh, people inside can buy food, uh, make phone calls and maintain lines of communication with their loved ones outside, um, and how to file grievances and track price gouging while by prison companies, among other things. The guide has been translated into Spanish. Uh, we're working on getting it translated into several other languages as well. It's available in several formats and it's been printed and distributed uh, inside and shared among organizers outside. Volunteers all also helped us to compile a long list of mutual uh, aid projects that are happening around the country and those are listed on our website. In addition, we collectively came up with a list of 22 demands that call for, uh, among other things, the immediate release of all prisoners. Because prison officials are notorious for withholding crucial information about the conditions inside, we demanded and demand um, that prisons make their plans public and we ask that medical units uh, remain fully staffed, including on weekends. We also called for stronger labor and safety protections for prisoners and demanded hazard pay for prisoners working in particularly dangerous circumstances. While our main goal is to get as many people out as we can, we also recognize that not everyone is going to be released. So we crafted many of our demands to protect those that would remain inside. Some of these things include making sure that pr prisoners would have free access to bleach and personal protective equipment, free commissary, um, eliminate sick call fees, um, and that prisons cease the use of pepper spray and other chemical agents that cause breathing complications. Our demands were written as broadly as possible and we encouraged organizers to create their own targeted list of demands so that they would reflect the needs of prisoners in their region or state. In the weeks following the publication of the guide, we received many calls and emails from people inside and from loved ones looking for help. When we could provide help directly, we did. We referred those that, couldn't, uh, that we couldn't help to other resources, including to organizations with the capacity to meet their needs. The point of sharing this example is to underscore the importance of grassroots organizing, um, being able to quickly respond to the needs of incarcerated people. Finally, I'd like to share some thoughts on where I think we go from here. And I wanna remind people that the crisis is not over, even as the United States has moved to reopen. Prisons are also reopening. 
which means that prisoners are returning to their prison jobs and in-person visits are resuming. Both of these activities bring prisoners into contact with more people who may be infected and increases their risk of contracting COVID-19. While we were able to secure the release of some prisoners, many states were reluctant to do mass releases, again, citing security concerns. We were also able to force prison phone providers to give free phone calls. But prison phone companies only offered one five minute free call once a week and in most cases stopped offering those several weeks ago. Efforts to secure compassionate release were successful in just a few cases. And even when governors agreed to use their executive powers to release prisoners, most did not follow through. It is important to take stock of these losses as well as the wins uh, because it lets us know, you know what strategies worked and what we need to improve for the next go around. What COVID-19 has revealed is that black, brown and poor people will bear the brunt of punitive policies and that the state is willing to sacrifice incarcerated people's lives under the guise of concern for public safety. We do not need death camps in our communities to ensure people's safety. The logic of disposability tells us that by stripping prisoners of their humanity, it becomes easier to justify their neglect and mass death because most people will simply not care. In the middle of a global pandemic, the situation is intensified. It has been an emotionally exhausting week uh, for black people in the United States. And I think it was just last night or this morning, the president um, has threatened to shoot people who are looting and protesting the police killing of George Floyd, a black man whose videotape lynching went viral. We are constantly being reminded of our disposability. What this moment has shown us is that we are not all in this together, that we are not the same. Those of us that do prisoner support and our loved ones inside have always known this. And we have always found ways to organize to save people's lives. How we think our, about our work in this moment matters a great deal. What are we willing to attend to? How are we showing up for incarcerated people and those impacted by the carceral state? How can we shift our resources to things that are life affirming? How do we connect our struggles so that we aren't just focusing on our day-to-day -day survival, but building a world that meets the needs of all of us? These are just some of the questions that I think that we need to take seriously. And I'm going to stop there because I could go on, um, but I wanna you know, make sure we have plenty of time for Q&A later. Thank you.